Picture this, a sleek futuristic warship slicing through coastal waters at speeds that make your average destroyer look like it's stuck in traffic. Its hull, a triple threat trimaran design, glides over the waves with an almost alien grace, while its deck bristles with helicopters and drones ready to leap into action. This isn't science fiction, it's the USS Independence LCS-2, the lead ship of the US Navy's Independence-class Littoral Combat Ship Fleet. Born from a bold experiment to redefine naval warfare in the shallow, chaotic zones near shore, the Independence represents a wild departure from tradition. But, like any trailblazer, its journey has been a roller coaster of ambition, innovation, and the occasional faceplant. Today we're diving deep into the story of this coastal warrior, where it came from, what it's capable of, and why it's poised to shape the Navy's future, even if it's stumbled along the way. Let's rewind to the late 20th century, when the U.S. Navy faced a reckoning. For decades, its Blue Water Fleet, think massive carriers, hulking battleships, and missile-packed destroyers, ruled the open ocean like undisputed heavyweight champs. But as the Cold War faded and new threats bubbled up closer to shore, the Navy realized it had a blind spot. Coastal waters, those murky green and brown zones near land, were becoming hotbeds of trouble. Swarms of fast attack boats, stealthy submarines, and minefields that could cripple a deep water giant. The Iowa-class battleships, with their thunderous 16-inch guns, had once provided devastating shore support, but they were retired in the 1990s, leaving a firepower gap. Enter the literal combat ship, LCS, program. A daring bid to build a new breed of warship that could fight, flex, and survive in these treacherous shallows. The LCS program wasn't the only idea on the table. Around the same time, the Navy toyed with the Future Destroyer program, which birthed the stealthy, controversial Zumwalt-class destroyers. Ships so expensive they nearly bankrupted the concept before it began. Then there was the new cruiser program, a half-baked plan to modernize the cruiser fleet that crashed and burned by 2011. But the LCS? That was the golden child, the one that actually made it out of the lab and into the water. The goal was simple yet audacious. Create a low-cost, small, multi-role vessel to replace the aging Perry-class frigates, protect amphibious landings, escort fleets, and guard America's coastlines. It had to be fast, shallow-drafted, and versatile enough to tackle anything from pirates to submarines, all without breaking the bank. Spoiler alert, it didn't quite stay cheap, but it sure delivered on the wow factor. In July 2002, the Navy laid out its wish list for this coastal warrior. They wanted speed to outrun threats, agility to dodge mines, and a modular design that could swap missions like a Swiss Army knife. Over the next year, the specs grew, and so did the stakes. By 2003, three industry giants, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, and Raytheon, stepped into the ring. A year later, the Navy pulled a wild card. Instead of picking one winner, they chose two. Lockheed Martin's Freedom Class went with a rugged, single-hull design, while General Dynamics teamed up with Austal USA to unveil the Independence Class, a trimaran marvel that looked like it had escaped from a sci-fi movie. The Navy's logic? Both had killer potential, Lockheed's reliability, and General Dynamics' innovation. So, why not build prototypes and let the sea decide? It was a gamble, but one that promised to push naval tech to the edge. The Freedom Class hit the water first, with USS Freedom LCS-1 commissioning in 2008. But the Independence Class stole the spotlight with its lead ship, USS Independence LCS-2. Construction kicked off in 2006 at Austale Shipyard in Mobile, Alabama, and by November 2008, she was tearing through sea trials at a blistering 46 knots, over 53 miles per hour, leaving jaws on the deck. Her propulsion system, a quartet of water jets powered by gas turbines and diesels, purred like a supercar, while her trimaran hull, a central spine flanked by two outriggers, cut through waves with surgical precision. By January 16, 2010, the Independence was commissioned, and the Navy had a new toy. A ship that didn't just fight, it danced across the water. To date, 13 Independence-class ships have been built, with seven in active service and each one carries the same DNA of speed, stealth, and adaptability. So, what makes the Independence class tick? Let's start with the hull. Unlike your typical warship, 
This isn't some bulky single-bodied brute. The trimaran design, borrowed from high-speed civilian ferries, uses three holes, a long, slender central body, and two shorter outriggers that act like stabilizers. Built from lightweight aluminum alloy, the ship measures 127.6 meters long and 31.6 meters wide, with a draft of just 4.27 meters, shallow enough to flirt with coastlines where deeper ships would run aground. At 2,176 tons standard and 2,784 tons fully loaded, it's a featherweight compared to destroyers like the Arleigh Burke class, which tip the scales at 9,200 tons. Yet, its top speed hits 50 knots, nearly 58 miles per hour, making it one of the fastest warships afloat. The secret? A hole that angles inward, slashing its radar signature to blend into the clutter of civilian traffic, paired with a waterline profile that minimizes drag and maximizes stability. That stability was no small feat. Early designs wrestled with the trimaran's tendency to roll in rough seas, a problem solved by those outriggers, which grip the water like a tightrope walker's pole. The result is a ship that doesn't just survive high sea states, it thrives. And then there's the deck space. Thanks to its wide, triple-hole layout, the Independence boasts a flight deck 40% larger than frigates of similar size, bigger even than the Arleigh Burks. Picture this. Two MH-60 Seahawk helicopters parked side by side, or a Seahawk teamed with three MQ-8B Fire Scout drones, or even a massive CH-53 Sea Stallion hogging the pad. It can handle simultaneous takeoffs and landings, something no other ship this light can pull off. When it sails next to Japan's 6,800-ton Akizuki-class destroyers, the Independence, at just 3,100 tons fully loaded, looks like the bigger beast. It's an optical illusion, the puffy effect of a wide, hollowed-out trimaran. But it's a flex that turns heads. Speed and space are just the beginning. The Independence class was built to be a shapeshifter. Its modular design lets it swap mission packages like outfits, anti-submarine gear one day, mine hunting tools the next, then surface combat systems for a showdown with enemy boats. It's armed with a 57mm Bofors gun for blasting small threats think speedboats or drones, plus 11 missile launchers for the RIM-116 rolling airframe missile to SWAT air threats. Add in advanced sensors, a C-4 ISR suite, and a stealth profile, and you've got a ship that can hunt subs, sweep mines, or sneak up on enemy shores for intel ops. It's not just a fighter, it's a scout, a medic, even a smuggler chaser. In special cases, it supported special forces insertions or doubled as a repair hub for other ships. The Navy calls it a literal combat ship for a reason. It's built to dominate the messy, close-in fights where flexibility is king. But let's not sugarcoat it. The LCS program and the independence class with it has had its share of drama. Critics have hammered it as a jack-of-all-trades, master of none arguing its lightweight frame and modest armament leave it outgunned by heavier destroyers. Early ships faced mechanical hiccups, cracked hulls, engine failures that fueled headlines and congressional grumbling. Costs balloon too. What started as a $220 million per ship dream crept closer to $600 million, prompting the Navy to scale back from a planned 55 ships to 35. By 2021, the Freedom Class saw early retirements LCS-1 and LCS-3 were mothballed after barely a decade, while the Independence class soldiered on, proving its trimaran grit. It's a classic tale of ambition outpacing execution, but the Independence has a knack for defying the doubters. Take its real-world track record. In 2016, USS Coronado, LCS-4, an Independence class ship, deployed to the South China Sea, flexing its speed and sensors amid tensions with China's naval buildup. In 2020, USS Gabrielle Gifford's LCS-10 fired a naval strike missile in a Pacific exercise, sinking a target ship with pinpoint precision, a warning shot to any adversary eyeing America's coastal flanks. These ships aren't just floating experiments, they're proving their worth in hot zones. And the Navy's not done dreaming. Plans are afoot to bolt on heavier weapons. Think anti-ship missiles or even lasers, using that generous deck space and a power system that churns out 40 megawatts. 
It's not the Zumwalt's hypersonic missile glow-up, but it's a sign the independence class could evolve into a lean, mean literal predator. So, where does the USS independence stand today? It's the poster child of a Navy in transition. America's blue water dominance is unchallenged, but the coastal game, where rogue states, terrorists, and near-peer rivals like China and Russia play, is heating up. The independence fills that gap with a shallow draft and lightning speed, weaving through waters where carriers fear to tread. It's networked to the teeth, linking with subs, planes, and satellites in a kill web that shares intel faster than you can say, fire. It's not about replacing the Arleigh Burks or the Zumwalts. It's about complementing them, a nimble sidekick to the heavy hitters. The Navy's bet is that 35 LCS ships, split between freedom and independence classes, will anchor its near-shore strategy for decades. Let's zoom in on the tech that makes this possible. The independence's propulsion is a hybrid beast. Two GELM-2500 gas turbines for high-speed sprints paired with two MTU diesel engines for cruising efficiency, all driving four Rolls-Royce water jets. It's like a sports car with an eco mode, 30 knots on diesels, 50 when the turbines kick in. The integrated power system divvies up juice between propulsion, weapons, and sensors, giving it flexibility you won't find on older ships. Its radar suite, led by the Saab Sea Giraffe, spots threats from 100 miles out, while sonar hunts subs beneath the waves. The stealthy hull, coated in radar-absorbing materials, shrinks its signature to fishing boat size, a trick that's kept it sneaky in exercises against mock foes. But it's not invincible. Submarines remain its kryptonite. No torpedo tubes or depth charges here, so it leans on fleetmates for anti-sub muscle. Mines and swarms of small boats can overwhelm its defenses if it's caught solo. Critics point to its aluminum hull, tough but less durable than steel, as a vulnerability in a slugfest. Yet the Navy counters that it's not meant for toe-to-toe -to -toe brawls. It's a hit-and-run artist, a coastal ninja that strikes and slips away. Real-world deployments back this up. Think drug busts off Central America or freedom of navigation ops in contested waters. It's not a battleship. It's a scalpel. The independence class's story mirrors the Zumwalt's in some ways a grand vision tempered by reality. Where the Zumwalt's $22 billion price tag axed it after three ships, the LCS's cost overruns trimmed its fleet, but didn't kill it. Both pushed boundaries, the Zumwalt with stealth and guns, the independence with speed and modularity. Both faced skeptics who called them overhyped, but where the Zumwalt found redemption in hypersonic missiles, the independence is carving its niche through adaptability. The Navy's tweaking the formula, more firepower, better reliability, and betting on ships like the USS Katherine Johnson LCS-14, named for the NASA legend, to carry the torch. Imagine Katherine Johnson herself at the helm, not literally, but in spirit. Her keel laying in 2019 was a tearjerker, a 101-year-old icon welding her initials into steel, a crowd roaring as history met the future. Launched in 2020 and commissioned in 2021 amid 4th of July fireworks, she's a symbol of resilience, hers and the ships. The independence class isn't perfect, but it's a fighter, stumbling forward like a scrappy underdog who keeps landing punches. With 13 ships built and more in the pipeline, it's rewriting the rules of literal combat, one high-speed dash at a time. So, what's next? The Navy's eyeing upgrades, maybe hypersonic weapons, maybe drones that launch from that massive deck. The independence class could become a testbed for tomorrow's tech, its power and space ripe for innovation. It's already a linchpin in the kill web, tying sensors and shooters across the fleet into a seamless net. In a world where coastal conflicts, think South China Sea standoffs or Persian Gulf flare-ups, are the new normal, this ship's agility could tip the scales. It's not about raw power, it's about being in the right place, at the right time, with the right tools. Here's the kicker. The independence class isn't just a ship, it's a mindset. It's the Navy saying, we can't rely on giants alone. It's a bet on speed over size, flexibility over firepower, brains over brawn. Sure, it's had its flops, cost overruns, early breakdowns, but name a pioneer that hasn't. 
The Wright brothers crashed planes, Edison blew fuses. The independence keeps sailing, proving doubters wrong one mission at a time. By 2030, it could be the unsung hero of America's coastal defense, a trimaran titan that turned a wild idea into a war-fighting reality. What do you think? Is the independence class a misunderstood masterpiece or a pricey experiment? Drop your thoughts below, hit that like button, and subscribe for more deep dives into the machines that shape our world. Thanks for sticking with me. I'll catch you in the next one.